Our next talk is with Jared Overson from North Carolina. We're happy to present to you him here to you on stage. Jared, uh, I think it's kind of a pet project of you, or a pet topic for you, because he's looking at the way criminals use leaked accounts for the criminal activities. What is happening once the data has spilled on the darknet, people are downloading this, what are they doing with these hash passwords, with their sometimes clear text passwords, and the millions and millions of email and account addresses? How can it do they transform this into money? I've seen the talk before. I've seen a previous version of the talk. I hear it's been extended. It is updated to the latest start of the art. And I think it's, for me, it was terrifying at first. And then I put it together and think, yeah, of course, that makes sense. That is what we have to expect when real criminal minds see money in front of their eyes. Welcome, Jared. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a great introduction. Um, so I'm going to be talking about credential stuffing uh, and automation in general. The automation is going to be mostly focused around websites and uh, uh, of websites, login forms. But I'm going to be talking about the arc that all of this is taking uh, because it's important to understand how this is evolving because it doesn't just apply to credential stuffing. Uh, it applies to uh, anything, uh, any API or service that we've output to the world uh, where behind it hides value. And it doesn't always, uh, it doesn't uh, also strictly apply just to websites, uh, applies to mobile applications, APIs, uh, services like SSH, whatever. So I'm going through the arc uh, so that you can see where things are going so that if you have different use cases, you can understand how to apply that to, uh, to uh, what you're doing. Uh, so I'm Jared Overson. I am the perpetually frustrated maker of things, and it, I'm, in a conference like this, uh, I think the perpetually frustrated is probably redundant because how can you possibly be working with computers nowadays and not just be like, why is this the way things are? We built computers, we built all this software, and it's still crazy. It's nuts, it drives me nuts every day, uh, but I'm trying to fix things as I go. I've worked at uh, from Napster, I spent a lot of my time at Shape Security where I was fighting bad guys, uh, doing credential stuffing. I learned about how these people were exploiting uh, everyday people like you, me, our family, and our children. Uh, and earlier this year, I started uh, Vino Technologies to apply a lot of those concepts that I learned at Shape Security and working with enterprises uh, to generalize them to uh, everyone. So we're going through three major parts here. Uh, what is driving the evolution? Uh, how uh, credential stuffing has evolved, and then where do we go from here? So uh, credential stuffing and automation in general is evolving for the same reason that anything ev evolves. There is incentive, and there's something in the way of getting what you want. Uh, <clears throat> the incentive in the case of credential stuffing uh, is just a ton of money. It's very, very lucrative to be selling accounts uh, that have some sort of value. And it's not just accounts like uh, from a bank uh, or, or anywhere where they're actually storing cash. Uh, it's any accounts, because all of these accounts have some value behind them. And criminals are very, very clever people. They will figure out how to exploit every last drop of value out of any, uh, any account they pop. And of course, the adversity is us. Now, really, what this means uh, is value versus how much it costs. Uh, there is a clear uh, expectation of value when people engage in attacks like these, uh, and then there is how much it is costing them. As long as the value outweighs the cost, uh, then they will keep on doing that. Now, uh, in the case of credential stuffing, what does it actually cost? First, you need credentials. And for anyone who's not entirely familiar with credential stuffing, it also goes by the name uh, credential replay. Uh, it's, uh, it's the act of taking previously known usernames and credentials and then trying them on other sites and services to find out who is reusing passwords so that you can then get into accounts for virtually no effort. So first, you need those previously uh, known credentials. And this is where those data breaches that we hear about all the time come into play. Uh, we hear about them, and we think, oh, they're bad. Uh, but it's hard for a lot of people to draw the link from that data breach to actual damage, damage that they can experience. And credential stuffing is one of the major ways that those breaches amount to actual damage. 
Uh, so you can get credentials uh, for free uh, by joining uh, any of those uh, forums with weird dark colors, maybe some spinning skulls, uh, and then download billions upon billions of credentials for literally nothing. Uh, you might remember collection number one from 2019, Troy Hunt wrote about it, which was uh, uh, millions upon millions of credentials. Uh, and then there was collections two, three, four, and five. In total, about 20 some odd billion credentials from breaches as far back as 2009, all distributed in one lump archive that anyone can download. So you can download these and then just uh, run them across any site. Now, you're obviously not going to type those in by hand. That would take way too long. So you need something that's going to automate it for you. You can download pre-made account checkers for free. You can buy them or you can create them yourself. Uh, but if you're just starting, you can start with whatever is free and work from there. So we are at a total cost of zero dollars so far. Next up, you're going to want to run it through some sort of proxy list, because if you are hammering out billions of requests from your laptop at home, it's going to be very obvious to any network administrator. You're going to be blocked automatically by rate limits. So you're going to need to distribute that traffic and make it seem like you're coming from all across the globe. And there are certainly some sort of defense uh, in the way that you're going to have to bypass probably in the form of something CAPTCHA-like, and uh, you're going to have to bypass that. And uh, there are API services, we'll get to those in a little bit, that do cost something, uh, but it is a, a, a fraction of a dollar per check request. So you're looking at a total of less than two-tenths of one US penny per tested credential. So that makes the break-even rate for accounts worth uh, $1 at 2%. At so if 0.2%, uh, sorry, uh, if 0.2% of your requests amount to an actual valid account, then you are doing okay. You're not losing money. Now at Shape, or, or, uh, at Shape we saw success rates about 2%, so 10 times that. And if you go to accounts reseller marketplaces, uh, the accounts frequently range between $3 and over $100 where the uh, higher value accounts are certainly things uh, where the, the uh, value to extract is more straightforward, so banks, uh, or where you can uh, transfer money or transfer anything that has value because that helps in money laundering. Uh, lower value accounts, uh, bulletin boards, uh, video game sites, things like that. But that range is pretty big. Uh, but regardless, the success rate and the, the lowest value uh, means that you can get away with a lot of money pretty quickly. Uh, for uh, about 100,000 tested accounts, if you're getting about a 2% success rate and you're selling those accounts for $10, uh, you are walking away with about $20,000 uh, after spending about $200 to run your attack. The return on your investment is substantial, and that is what's fueling a lot of this evolution. So how has this automation evolved? we am going through about 10 years of automation evolution, again, to paint the arc so that you can see where this thing's going without talking to me ever again. At its start, any basic automation is the lowest level thing that you can do. Uh, and it started with certainly curl, wget, whatever, just sent requests. And then as use cases for these types of automation became clear, then you got tools that are specialized for those types of attacks. Tools like Sentry MBA, which was a specialized tool dedicated to uh, performing credential stuffing off the, uh, the uh, earlier websites uh, where you just basically hammer HTTP requests through proxies uh, and you record the success results into a text file and you move on. Early defense we talked about uh, a little bit, IP rate limiting. Uh, it's the, the hammer in every network administrator's toolbox. Uh, you see something coming, you see too much coming from one place, you just knock it down and move on. Uh, the uh, attacker's response there was to then rotate through proxies, and you can find free proxy lists uh, all over the internet. Uh, but those are often thwarted by things like IP reputation. Uh, for a proxy that's open, uh, for a proxy that, that is cheap, it becomes pretty clear that a lot of the traffic going through that is not exactly the type of traffic that you want hitting your legitimate login site, so it's easy to just knock those down. Now, uh, attackers then move to things like uh, Luminati, which is a residential proxy network. This is a proxy service that routes traffic through home networks. 
So it's no longer just this IP address that seems to have a whole lot of bad traffic coming through it. It's this IP address that, is, uh, that has a lot of legitimate, normal human family home traffic. Now you might ask uh, what normal legitimate human family uh, would be running a proxy like this uh, at home, uh, and that would be a good question. It, it's services like Ola VPN that allow uh, this to happen. So Ola VPN uh, is a free VPN service. Uh, last I checked, it was unencrypted. It's not a very uh, useful VPN service for the, for the reasons that most of us use VPNs. Uh, but for a teenager or somebody who watches a lot of like Netflix or streaming services or, or music streaming services, uh, services like this can make it look like your traffic is coming from Australia or United States or wherever, and then unlock an entirely new section of the catalog that was previously inaccessible to you due to regional restrictions. So you get people using services like this because it gives additional value to services they're already paying for. And then of course, when that VPN is not in use and the computer is idle, then it turns into a proxy for services like Luminati. Uh, defense against uh, rotating through uh, proxies. We saw uh, the world go through it. It's uh, text-based CAPTCHA. We saw recaptcha version one, two squiggly words. Uh, don't have to spend too much time on those because thankfully we are mostly done with those. Uh, but that spawned uh, an industry around uh, defeating these things. So services like two CAPTCHA, anti-CAPTCHA, death by CAPTCHA, these are API services that give you the ability to tie in automatically solving a CAPTCHA into a script or program or whatever. I'm not sure if you can read uh, down uh, one of the, the lower paragraphs there. Uh, death by CAPTCHA starts from an incredibly low price of $1.39 per 1,000 solved CAPTCHAs or 99 cents if you're a gold member. So it's an extremely cheap way of uh, automating through CAPTCHAs like text-based CAPTCHAs or click things CAPTCHAs, click and drag CAPTCHAs, Google's reCAPTCHA, uh, whatever. Now, it's not that they are uh, just complete geniuses and have found ways to, uh, to programmatically bypass these. Uh, they delegate these requests to actual humans sitting down and solving CAPTCHAs all day for fractions of a penny. You just get their results via an API call, and then you plug it into your program and you move on. Uh, the response um, from the defender side, uh, as, as web uh, advanced, JavaScript became more prevalent, more reliable. Uh, everything became more JavaScripty, and uh, defenses became more dynamic. And this made it so that all existing tools that did not actually understand how web pages work stopped working. You had to now use things that could understand the environment of web pages. So def uh, attackers uh, moved towards scriptable web views. Web views are like the portion of a browser that actually displays pages. It's what you see in uh, mobile applications uh, when you stay in the application and, and you, pop a, or you, you view a web page. Uh, these are scriptable versions of web views like that, so you can programmatically go to URLs, click on things, do whatever. And this made it very difficult to identify bad traffic because it looked identical to all other traffic. So we had to dig into uh, ways of detecting it at a lower level, things like the way that the network requests are sent to us. You can see uh, up in the, the upper side, uh, a browser like Chrome will always send its host header as the first header in the HTTP request. PhantomJS, for whatever reason, always sends its host header as the last header. Just things like that make it easy to identify an entire swath of application traffic. Now, PhantomJS is a legitimate tool. Uh, it was built by a colleague of mine for developers in, in QA to test things. That's uh, not a bad application, uh, but legitimate usage of something like PhantomJS on production websites is so small, it becomes easy to just block all of it and then move on from there. Now, that is what shifts the attacks uh, into uh, defeating a defense and then hammering away as fast as possible uh, to now shifting into looking more like legitimate users. So the next iteration from the attacker side is scripting uh, actual production browsers. 
So using things like Puppeteer, Playwright, Selenium, uh, those drive the same uh, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, Edge uh, that you use on your home devices, so it becomes impossible uh, to classify uh, attacks based on tool because everyone's using the same browser now. So the defense uh, from the, the defender side is to now fingerprint the browser. This is kind of like IP rate limiting, uh, where uh, if, you, if you see a bunch of uh, traffic coming from a single network resources, you, you can knock it down. If you spread that across, it becomes difficult to use that as your rate limit. But if you can find the computer that that traffic is originating from and fingerprint that browser or computer, uh, then all that traffic will still look like it's originating from a single source, and then you can block or rate limit that fingerprint. Uh, this is the same type of technology that uh, advertisers use to track you. Well, maybe not you, because you're in areas that have laws against stuff like that. But in the US, uh, that is how advertisers track all of us. Now, because a lot of that technology uh, is rooted in ad technology uh, and tracking technology, there was a lot of precedent for how to bypass it. Uh, and any tool that would allow you to bypass or block being tracked by an advertiser then allows you to block or bypass being uh, fingerprinted by a company trying to block credential stuffers. So you can use tools like FraudFox or AntiDetect, uh, which are full tools that wrap uh, the, the fingerprint uh, avoiding logic into something that you don't have to worry about or think about, and you just run your attacks through what feels like a browser. Uh, these are largely used for fraud-related services. Uh, you can tell by the name FraudFox, they don't seem to hide it very much. So then it became, uh, on the defender side, analyzing the user behavior and trying to understand what a good user looks like and what a bad user looks like. This is an example of automation. Looks strange, right? Like if you saw this visualized, you would look at it and be like, that's, that's not a human. It's very easy to detect what is definitely not a human when you collect user behavior uh, because tools like Puppeteer, Phantom, Selenium, Playwright, uh, they're not trying to emulate human behavior. They're just trying to, to faithfully allow you to execute and understand and analyze web pages. So when you need to click on something, you're clicking on the 00xy coordinate, and that's it. When you're typing, uh, you're either typing all at once or you're typing with very, very standard specific intervals because that's all that's what's necessary for those libraries. So when you start to analyze user behavior, it becomes very, very easy to block based off that. Now the obvious iteration, and hopefully you can see the trajectory things are going here, uh, on the attacker side is to emulate human behavior. This is uh, an example of Browser Automation Studio, uh, which uh, you can see uh, the, the text is coming in uh, fits and spurts. The mouse is moving around, not in a straight line. It's stalling some places. It's moving around. It's clicking at different parts of elements. And the, the trick here is to not, you don't need to look perfectly human. You just need to look definitely not a bot. And it's pretty easy to do that. So the defender's response there is to now look at the lies that an attacker is telling us and try to, uh, try to determine how many lies uh, is an acceptable number uh, before you start blocking traffic. Now lies like uh, telling, uh, telling uh, you that you are mobile Safari, yet you uh, allow playing and support the Og Vorbis file format. Things like that, that's not true, if I'm actually correct. Yes, Safari does not support Og Vorbis. So when you're an attacker and you're spreading traffic across the globe and you're trying to look like you're a whole bunch of different legit legitimate traffic coming from a handful of devices, you have to lie a lot. You have to spread that fingerprint data uh, through a, a, enough of a range that it's hard for anyone to fingerprint you, uh, but then you also now have to not lie about any of those fingerprintable data points. You can't just randomize these things. You have to have a believable set uh, so that your, your lie threshold is under what gets you blocked. Now, from the attacker side, uh, the response was naturally to use real browser data. 
This is a Bablosoft's fingerprint switcher, uh, which collects legitimate fingerprints from uh, real devices and browsers, and then provides that through an API service, plugins, whatever, so that you can rotate through legitimate fingerprints and bypass uh, that sort of device consistency check. Uh, other ways of doing this are taking uh, Defender scripts, placing them on high traffic other sites or forums, and then just using those scripts to just collect all the data that a particular uh, vendor or whatever is looking for and then replay that or sell it as a service. And then, of course, we have multi-factor authentication and risk scoring. Now, this uh, trajectory, it's not necessarily one after the other. Uh, we've, we've interspersed them. Uh, some companies have skipped some, some have layers. Uh, but we certainly have uh, seen plenty of multi-factor authentication. Uh, you get a fancy little code, you, you move on. Uh, the problem with multi-factor authentication uh, is that it is a pain in the butt for a lot of users. It causes a lot of customer support calls. Uh, it is not necessarily the uh, easiest thing to, to do for people who are not technically apt. Uh, so uh, as companies, we try to present uh, the multi-factor authentication gate as little as possible so that we don't uh, hinder real usage. So the response from attackers is to now hijack sessions and user computers and all their fingerprint data and everything possible about that user and then sell the user itself as a product to people looking to take advantage of others. So this is the Genesis Marketplace, which is uh, a, a, a three-fold uh, product suite. Uh, it includes a browser and uh, a plugin and this marketplace so that when you purchase, uh, let's say, user-pc4f8 blah, 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 you get all of those accounts. You get that user. No one else can buy that user. That user is yours. The malware, that, uh, the, one of the parts of the Genesis suite is malware that resides on this computer. Uh, as long as that stays there, it will update that user record, record with uh, password changes, new sessions, uh, new, new uh, browser data. So as long as you don't alert, uh, make that user think that anything weird is going on with their computer, you have that user pwned in perpetuity. Now, if you, have, uh, if you have the fingerprint data, if you have the session ID, uh, and if you are logging in from a region close to where that user logs in from, uh, most sites will just let you through. The risk for that traffic is usually deemed low enough that you're not gonna be prompted with a multi-factor authentication gate. So then you can sail through and do whatever you need to do. So, there, the, this keeps on going on, uh, but rather than, than keep on going back and forth uh, for the rest of my life, uh, this hopefully gives you enough of the arc so that for the use cases that you have to worry about, you can, you can imagine where things are go, where things are going. And they're going towards emulating legitimate user traffic uh, to the most perfect degree. So there are so many pieces of advice that I could give you. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of them are fairly specific. If you would love to come talk to me afterward, please do. I could talk about this stuff for hours. Um, but in general, uh, one of the most important things you can do is bring security and fraud teams into the user experience uh, process. We can't automate or we can't optimize strictly for the best user experience for our good users because that makes things really, really easy for our bad users. So uh, things like limiting, de uh, delaying, and varying feedback in the user experience, uh, even something like a forgot password flow. Like if you, if you uh, forgot password on some site, you go there, you enter, enter your email address, you'll probably notice that some sites uh, say, sorry, that user is not in our database. Would you like to create a count or something like that? That little bit of information gives an attacker the information necessary to know that this is an email we shouldn't try when credential stuffing attacks because it doesn't exist on this site. Just little things like that uh, uh, are decisions that security and fraud teams probably know, uh, but user experience teams will not uh, apply every day. Uh, reduce your surface area. I uh, could say that over and over again. Uh, funnel risky spots into bottlenecks. Don't have 18 different purchase flows or login flows across 36 different apps uh, because that makes it very, very easy for attackers to just cycle through each one of those because they're going to have different defense profiles. 
uh, and then finally, uh, build a system of dials and levers. Uh, you need to be able to respond quickly. You need to be able to respond uh, potentially in ways that you didn't expect. You can't wait for uh, development and, and iteration cycles uh, to get out a defense when you are under attack. You need to be able to respond quickly, uh, potentially in critical flows, and you need to have a system that's in place and allows you to do that without going through the product development lifecycle. Uh, and finally, uh, please stop using CAPTCHAs. Um, hopefully it's, it's not a major issue in this part of the world because you're all very, very smart people, but in the US we're seeing this everywhere and it's driving me nuts. Now, CAPTCHAs as a way, or, or tests like these, as a way to gather user data and use that uh, to assess the risk of the traffic is not a bad thing, uh, but tests like these where the actual gate is a successful response to the test, that doesn't work. And that just does nothing except really, really, really bother your good users. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Do you have questions in the room? Mark has left. We don't have a question for Mark there. Uh, Jared, I was going, when the attacker, oh, there is one. Hey, OK. Mike is coming. Very good. That was, that was just a poor question for myself. Thanks for the talk. Um, what do you think about those invisible captures like the new Google recapture? or other alternatives? Do you think that this is a good defense? Uh, there are uh, a lot of different, I mean, it, it's, it's hard to call them CAPTCHAs uh, at that point. They are, uh, uh, they are risk assessment tools, uh, and, and Google knows a ton about the world. They, they, know, they know where IPs have been, they know uh, what IPs have searched for what, uh, they have a lot of data, uh, and their tools are very, very good. Google uh, version 3 does a good job of scoring. Uh, the problem with any tool, though, that everybody uses, especially free ones like that, is that it incentivizes services like those capture solvers to specifically have products that bypass those. So they might do a fantastic job if you are legitimately using them, but attackers whole uh, the foundation is not legitimately using things. So uh, to, to bypass something like that, uh, uh, I forget which service I, I used, uh, but they, they delegate the, uh, the, the analysis that the recapture does uh, to a farm of computers that produce known good results, and then you get the response that you're supposed to respond with back, and then you get the response, you get the risk score that those computers got. So there are ways to bypass all these things, and a lot of the value in a defense is having a defense that is specific to a particular product or even a subsection of your product, so that it requires an attacker to specifically target that and bypass it specifically, as opposed to just, just uh, defer to some service and plug in an API key. Serge? So, I mean, it seems a big part of this is fingerprinting. When we turn on fingerprinting, user start complain so a big part of this is fingerprinting. But when we turn fingerprinting on, we get users complaining, oh, you're violating my privacy. Can we defend in a privacy-respecting manner to this privacy-violating business? So uh, the, the problem with the way the fingerprinting is used right now in this case is that it's, uh, it's just using uh, the stuff that's available, try and get a foothold on the problem. Uh, there's certainly very little privacy invasion using it uh, if, you're key, if the data is being kept in-house, uh, because if your users are logged in and they, if they've got a session cookie, you're already tracking them throughout your entire service. Uh, so it's, it, it, it will trigger the same sort of privacy uh, uh, notifications if, if there are uh, sensors turned on. Um, it's just being used for, for, different, for different purposes, not trying to 
to track you uh, searching for, for adopting a kitten on this website to sell you kitty litter on that website. You're trying to protect people, but using, using whatever you have available. Is there another question up there? Thank you. Maybe to link into the previous question, uh, what we see is more and more users trying to evade that fingerprinting market by using DuckDuckGo or whatever obfuscators for their sessions and their private data that they don't want to be spit around the internet. Uh, what is your feeling in, in the future? Is this like an adverse effect on trying to protect by, by the people just um, eliminating all fingerprinting <laughs> that we could use. Yeah, no, I, I think fingerprinting is, uh, is not, not very effective in fraud defense uh, anymore. Uh, I think it was one of, the, it's, it was one of those technologies uh, that, was, that was useful for a very brief period of time, uh, but attackers rapidly moved past that because there was so much precedent on how to block it. Uh, and it's, it's not difficult to see uh, exactly what a page is doing in JavaScript or, or WebAssembly nowadays uh, so that you can uh, see what's being collected uh, and then understand what you need to pr produce in order to uh, get a valid response. Uh, it's, it's very, very ineffective, so it's not something that uh, is, I would recommend relying on anymore. Good. Thank you very much also for the questions thank and thank you for your talk. Here is a bit of chocolate. <laughs> thank you, Christian. <laughs> thank you, Jared.